Our final talk um, of the day is from Dr. Elizabeth Fox, the Hecht Levi Postdoctoral Fellow at Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics. Please welcome Dr. Fox. Thank you. Okay, I have the challenge of being after everybody, but also the benefit of being after everybody. <laughs> So I'm going to be sharing some of my work um, that I've completed as a postdoctoral fellow at the Berman Institute of Bioethics related to equity values and the future of food and the great food transformation that is needed to support sustainable diets. So I think there's been only one presentation that has defined sustainable diets. <laughs> Um, so the FAO defines sustainable diets as diets that have low environmental impacts which contribute to food and nutrition security and to healthy life for present and future generations. It, they not only reflect various aspects of environmental sustainability, but they also represent economics and livelihoods, access to affordable and nutritious foods, socio-cultural norms, and issues of equity and human rights. And people working in the realm of sustainable diets are often looking into questions about whether and how we can meet the growing needs for food in the world while also staying within environmental boundaries. The World Resources Institute proposes five solutions to shift the anticipated environmental impact needed to meet the dietary needs of growing populations to global targets. And in some way, these are aligned really nicely with the great food transformation that's described in the Lancet Eat Commission. And I also want to bring to note, it's not just one solution, it's a set of solutions that we need in order to meet these goals. So the first is to reduce demand. The second, um, to increase production efficiency, increase fish supply, use production management practices that could reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and that we protect and restore natural ecosystems. And they propose a number of very specific strategies to do that, including shifting diets towards more plant-based diets, or more plant-based foods. And this is largely because ruminant meats, shown at the top, so that's cattle, um, sheep, and goat, as well as other animal source foods, so here you can see pork, chicken, fish, dairy, and eggs, have a higher average effect on greenhouse gas emissions, land use, energy use, eutrophication potential, and acidification potential compared to plant-based products, which are shown at the bottom of the graph. Oops. And this shift in diets towards more plant-based foods is represented by this graphic from the Lancet Eat, which you've already seen four times, um, and which illustrates a greater average proportion of vegetables and legumes and a smaller proportion of food stemming from animal source products um, and animal source foods. And it's not so far-fetched because the Canadian dietary guidelines that came in, out in January are quite well aligned with that. And in the Lancet Eat Commission, we tried to account for di diets that were both healthy and environmentally sustainable. So to what extent are those diets actually healthier? Um, in terms of an health, animal source foods are an important source of essential nutrients including vitamin B12, iron, and zinc. And it will be difficult to meet requirements for those foods without being really intentional about the foods that one is eating. Um, so I don't think, it's not to say that it's not possible, but you have to be paying attention to what you're eating to make sure you're meeting your nutrient needs and or having access to micronutrient supplementation. The analyses for healthy and sustainable diets that were presented in the Lancet Eat Commission build on a number of population-based studies that associate high meat consumption with um, high meat consumption and high processed meat consumption with a number of different non-communicable diseases. So this work here by um, David Tillman and Mike Clark, who are some of the co-authors on the Lancet Eat Commission, show a greater reduction in relative risk for diabetes, cancer, and coronary mortality for Mediterranean, pescatarian, and vegetarian diets compared to more omnivorous diets, which would be higher in meat. And frankly, in comparison to the sustainable diet recommendations as described by the Lancet Commission, we are way above where we need to be. So the little circle with the dotted line is the recommended um, boundaries. And you can see we're way above in terms of animal source foods, as well as starchy vegetables. And in the United States in particular, 
we're contributing more to this impact than in other places of the world. We have some of the highest production rates for beef and very high consumption rates as well. So this means that we have more of a moral obligation to make changes in our diets and practices. So today I'm going to be sharing with you some of the work that I've been doing as a postdoctoral fellow on a project on beef, food choices, and values. And the overall goal of the project is to identify policies and interventions that are ethically permissible, effective, and acceptable to stakeholders for altering beef production and consumption to levels that would sustain planetary and human health. And we're driven by three specific aims. The first is to identify the values and trade-offs, and trade-offs, by trade-offs I mean trade-offs in health, environment, labor, culture, et cetera, and trigger points for potential shifts to beef production and consumption practices, and we're doing that using interviews and surveys. The second is to identify relevant considerations for a set of different policy options that will be modeled. And then the third is to develop a framework to evaluate the ethical permissibility of those different intervention options. Um, today I'm just going to be giving you some of the preliminary, a preliminary view of some of the interviews that we've done with consumers in California and Nebraska and producers across the United States. So as we talk about dietary shifts, we need to think about consumers' autonomy and their preferences. It's really hard to get people to make changes in their diets. And making changes in people's diets requires us to understand where people are coming from, what matters to them, and how they make decisions. With the consumers we interviewed, our preliminary findings add to existing research, such as this shown here from the World Resources Institute, that shows that price is the primary concern for people when they're deciding what foods to buy. Um, so as noted by Jen, one of our participants, and all of these are pseudonyms that the participants chose themselves, so just FYI, um, I think it's important to also have an affordable substitute. If we're going to say, hey, these are the problems with this, then there's got to be a way you can get the foods you need at an affordable price. Other things that we found that were couldn't present challenges to sustainable diets are that health considerations, I mean, this isn't so much of a challenge, it could be something we can leverage, but um, health considerations outweighed environmental ones. So Jeff says, there's a lot of people who feel that eating less beef is both the healthy and environmental thing to do. But myself, I'd say right now, it's more about health. As I'm learning about it, it makes sense. People are also receiving a lot of mixed information about what to eat, and I think that speaks to some of the presentations this morning, that if you're not receiving any information in your 15-minute visit with your doctor, you're probably going to go to sources that might not be as reliable. So Chris says that information comes from everywhere, and Jay says, I'm very confused all the time and have no idea what to think about food. Is that crazy? I just hear so much conflicting information about food now. And I think taste is something that we can't neglect. Um, not all alternatives are created equal, and when people don't have cooking skills or time to cook foods that are tasty, um, we can't expect them to want to eat those foods. So Sally says, I had a Beyond Burger once. It was terrible. I don't know why they try to make it look like a meat patty, but it just didn't taste or look very good. And then all this stuff that is made with tofu to try to make phony meat, that also doesn't taste very good. So I think there's major opportunities um, where we can try to improve practices. But conversations about sustainable diets are not just about consumers. They're also about producers and production practices, and I think we've heard about some of that today. The range of impact is actually quite variable for producers. So if you look at that top line of the ruminant meat, it's pretty skewed towards the top. That's the mean, is pretty skewed. So that means that the highest impact producers are disproportionately contributing to the overall imp environmental impact. And there are management practices that can actually sequester carbon. It's just not, it's very difficult and not many people do it but it speaks to opportunities of being able to push those averages down. And so I think that that's something that needs to be on the table in these discussions. Um, coming back to this graphic from the World Resources Institute, there are a number of potential strategies um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but many producers aren't doing it. So it's important to understand where producers are coming from, as well as what factors influence what they're doing. 
So I'm going to share some of the insights from our producers. I do want to note that we have a very biased sample of producers who are willing to speak with us and who practice more sustainably than probably the majority of other producers. So sustainability was an underlying goal for many of the producers we spoke with, and that economics, profit, and financial well-being were a very important part of that. So it can't just be at a loss in terms of um, for production practices. Conservation and land management were also cornerstones of many producers' commitment to sustainability. They talked about rotational grazing methods, um, na protecting native grasses and wildlife, and being able to see changes over the past 10, 20 years in reductions in wildlife. It's something they care deeply about. Um, buffer zones and manure management. So there are a lot of strategies um, to improve practices. Um, as Trey says, sustainable can be somewhat of a buzzword that's overused, but we define that by the ways that I described earlier by people, community, natural resources, conservation, and profitability. Those are our goals, to be able to have success in all of those areas simultaneously, with the success in one not at the expense of success at the other. The ranching lifestyle is part of many producers' identity as well. They do it because they love it and are passionate about it. The landscape, the animals, the environment, conservation. Um, as Patrick says, if it wasn't for the way of life, the lifestyle, the peace of mind, and the mental therapy that you get out of owning a place, the returns are low enough that you either have to be passionate about doing it or you better find something else to do. So it's not necessarily that most producers are making bank, <laughs> so to speak. Um, but there's also room for improvement. There is recognition, at least among the producers that we spoke with, that not all producers are practicing sustainable practices. Henry says, I think one of the things that we're guilty of in the beef industry is that we try to promote the best practices and put forth what we're doing and responsible and sustainable and so forth, and that's not always the case. And so we've got to make sure that we're bringing those other producers who are not practicing sustainably on board and that they're moving in that direction. And Henry wasn't the only person who talked to us about that. We had other producers who talked about neighbors and friends not necessarily partaking in what you would consider to be the most sustainable practices, and that they had challenges in even bringing those people to meetings to learn about sustainable practices from the industry or from cooperative extension. So I think that that's also an opportunity that we need to look into um, to improve what we're doing. There's also a lot of discussion about disconnects between producers and consumers. Most consumers lack knowledge and awareness of production. They were often described as being disconnected from the production system. Um, as Courtney says, I think my perspective is more that the consumers don't necessarily understand what they're demanding, not really realizing what else they consume and how much worse it may be or may similar it may be. The producers we spoke to were all very confident in their practices and believed that being open and transparent was important, not just for themselves, but also the industry, and recognized the need for that um, transparency. And kind of speaking to some of the points that were mentioned earlier, um, I don't think that consumers pay or value the full costs associated with production. And Lucia asked, what would you say if your child were to say, I want to become a farmer? And I challenge all of you to think about that for your present children or non-existent ones. <laughs> I'm an activist, and I'm really in it for the farming. But you know what? To be really frank, if either my son or daughter said, I'm going to become a farmer, there's an element of me that would have been disappointed. It's a cultural thing about how respected and honored the profession of farming is. And that goes back into, also very deeply into, how much people think they should be paying for food and how important that is. And that's a big deal. So in conclusion, um, eating food and ranching cattle are deeply personal practices. They're shaped by conceptions of identity, culture, and family. And economics are an important aspect of um, those practices in terms of prices for consumers or profitability for producers. So how do we incorporate that into conversations about sustainable diets? And what do we do when economics and lifestyle aspects are at odds with current recommendations? Who's responsible for bearing that burden um, of those costs that might be unevenly distributed? 
There are major barriers to accessing and using information as well, both among consumers and producers. So how do we reach those who are not necessarily engaging with what we might consider best practices? Um, so I think that the Lancet Eat Commission recommendations are valid and they're something we should be aiming for. Um, but I think in doing so, we need to be conscious, thoughtful, and respectful of all of these different factors that we that are part of sustainability um, when we're talking about shifting diets and to move out of our silos in order to make the great food transformation a reality. <laughs>